David here. A quick note before we begin. Patty McMahon is a radio friend of mine from Philadelphia. She spent years working with Terry Gross as a producer for Fresh Air. My plan was to interview her about editing and her experiences working on a world-class show with a legendary host, but we ended up much deeper than that. I've divided this interview up into three parts. This is the first part. It is all about editing, making decisions of what to put in and what to keep out. Part two, that one is about booking guests. And we're also going to talk about what happens when things go sideways, including the story of Terry's infamous interview with Gene Simmons. I saw Terry Gross speak a few years ago and she mentioned this. She said, the one interview people always ask me about, this is out of hundreds of interviews, is the Gene Simmons interview. Patty was there in the studio when that happened. We dive deeper into that, what really happened. We're also talking about the ethics of interviewing on that session, working with booking agents, payola, things you might not think about but are important when it comes to interviewing. Part three, that one is about podcasting versus radio. The opportunity that we have as podcasters right now, the opportunity that veteran radio hosts and producers have right now. If you want to make sure that you get all three parts, this is how to do it. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. I've got three buttons there, one for iPhone, one for Android, one with an RSS feed. It will make sure that you get all three parts of this And trust me on this, you want all three parts of this because we cover a lot. It's going to be important to you. It makes your podcast better. It makes your hosting better. You're interviewing better. You're going to get a lot out of it. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. And without further ado, here's your regularly scheduled Build a Big Podcast. This is Big Podcast. It's Build a Big Podcast, the marketing podcast for podcasters. David Hooper with you. Bigpodcast.com is the site. And I've got a friend of mine here, Patty McMahon. She's out of Philadelphia. She's worked at WHYY. You've heard her work without even realizing it because she worked for a number of years with Terry Gross. We're going to dive into that, Patty's experience. We're going to talk about edits, what makes a good edit, what's the difference between podcasting and radio, because she is not only an audio journalist, but also a podcast producer. I'm so glad to be talking to you, Patty, because you're a fellow radio person, but also involved with podcasting. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Your first radio job, it, it's so interesting you worked with Terry Gross. I saw her speak in Philadelphia three or four years ago, and she was talking about starting in the late 60s, early 70s. And she said something that I thought was interesting. She said, this sounds weird, but when I started in radio, I had actually never heard my voice. We didn't have the technology. And you're about my age. We're Gen X. <laughs> We're Gen X. Even us, we didn't have the opportunity to record like people do now. And radio was a a very limited thing. So let's talk a minute about how you got into it, because I want to track your career. And uh, we'll talk about even what you're doing now, because you moved on from radio to podcasting. I was very fortunate that Fresh Air was my first radio gig. It was so good, I stayed nine years. I was an associate producer. We were still cutting tape, quarter-inch tape. We did not go from tape editing to Pro Tools until 2007. Wow. So we were still cutting tape, and Fresh Air is created as a live show. It's live at noon. It's distributed to, say, Chicago, other places, and, you know, other affiliates capture it and play when they want. But we, you know, we treated it as a live show. show. So we would still, you know, be like, say, six minutes to live. And Danny Miller, the wonderful producer of Fresh Air, um, would be like, all right, we got to lose three seconds. And then we go (laughs) into the tape. And we lose three seconds or whatever it is. and Because you're down um, to the second on those edits, right? Yes. We don't think about that in podcasting. That's one of the luxuries we've got. Right. So we were, you know, you were beholden to the NPR network. And then, of course, the local funders and promos that you need to adjust to as well. Some people think it's kind of strange that that was uh, my first gig was at a top radio show. But I have to say, I was raised around top ears, we'll say. My parents are both entertainers from New York. My mother's an actress. My father's a musician who ended up being a uh, music engineer at Mercury Studios in New York City in the 60s. So if we didn't have mics at home all the time from my father always recording the family, he would put a mic around, a little reel-to-reel around his neck and follow us all around and record us. Instead of having a Christmas card one year, he pressed like hundreds of 45s as our, (laughs) it's Christmas 1970 and I was a screaming baby. He was way ahead of his time, certainly. Engineers are a particular type, but they're my favorite people. They're artists. They're also perfectionists. So then wherever we lived, we always had a dark room and we had a recording studio that he would painstakingly build. So we were always recording 
all kinds of things. And this is like, what, the 70s and 80s. So people weren't familiar with just somebody shows up with this huge tape machine and mics a room and then yells at you because you're not close enough to the mic. <laughs> well, it's, it's like back to what Terry was saying. It's like you just didn't have exposure. You didn't have to the exposure. Kind of yeah. Even today, you think the problems that we have with remote guests, a lot of people still don't know how to use a mic. And that's even people who have familiarity with the old XLRs and everything. It's true. Although we did have those little cassette players in the 80s. And I recorded my friends all the time and interviewed them, stopped the tape, did all that. I didn't edit the little tape. I didn't edit until college. And that was your start with professional radio and editing? Really, really editing was college because I did go to Temple University as a broadcast journalist. I mean, that was my focus. I wanted to work on NPR type pieces and look what happened. It was um, a time where everybody wanted to be a video maker because MTV was still happening. All I did was listen. I didn't watch. I was a listener person. Yeah. I love editing tape. I don't, I don't even really mention it sometimes to people now because I don't want to have to do the exhausting backstory of what it really is. People don't understand how much work it was. And you probably have right. the sliced fingers to prove it. It's not even safe. What also probably helped with fresh air, though, I imagine there's a difference between working with somebody like Terry Gross, who's, a, I mean, at that point, she's been doing it for 20 years, maybe. Yeah, 20, 25. Good on the air. Mm -hmm. She's not making the mistakes that somebody like I would make or somebody in college radio would make. So editing would be, I would think, a whole lot easier. Let's talk about the edits that you make to somebody like her. I could tell you how we did it. The one thing is, when you're thinking about edits... You think about how big is your staff, if you have a staff, you know, who's your audience? Do you have a strict time allotment? All those things for, you know, how you're editing. We were fortunate that we had teams. So two of us would pair up and edit an interview. So we'd log it real time and go through a pass and then see as many passes that we need until it was shaped the way that we wanted it to. And the interview is how long? How long is that raw tape? 52, 52 minutes. You're doing it live and your show is an hour show. Yep. So with commercials, that's a pretty, I guess you're pretty close to the time that you need? Well, as it was different. It, it depended on, it was always different. There was, um, we had, I don't know what, I don't know what Fresh Air does now, but there was about two tapings a day in addition to the live show. Tapings meaning, you know, interviews. And all interviews are not made to be 52 minutes. Some are 12 minutes. Some are 13 minutes. And you would go in knowing that? You don't know. You just record, you hope for the best, and then you keep the best tape. So sometimes, as we call them reels, or you can call them blocks, block one, two, or block A, or we would sometimes just have like two or three different interviews if they were shorter. And we would occasionally call them like an accordion interview, like they could be small or long. Right. If the person was a really great interview, we called that a five reeler, which was all of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so really, what I was, I was really happy. I was trained to just keep the best. And uh, Neil Conan, God bless him, RIP, had quoted somebody else by saying, um, you know, the, the best tape is, is on the studio floor. You just can't cry over some of your best tape. Explain that a minute. So best tape. So you're literally slicing tape. Mm -hmm. And when we say studio floor, we're talking about like you've sliced it and. Oh, yeah, this is, this is not metaphorical. Yeah, it's funny. Although I could call it a take up reel. It was a take up reel, perhaps. Okay. Which one day I hope to would assemble it, make some funny kind of thing. And my God, I was so sick of take up reels. Um, but I still have them as decorations in my house, to tell you the truth. I have. I do. <laughs> The process. So, you know, you go back and forth with editing the content, you know, with what they're saying. Because what I found now in hindsight, <laughs> um, I was used to professional studio recordings of everything, of Terry and of the guest. So I didn't have to adjust any EQ, anything, noise reduction. Like, what? Noise reduction? That's noise reduction is just don't pour your water near the microphone. As Terry right. would always tell people, it sounds like you're peeing. So stop down and pour your water. <laughs> she had the same rap every time. <laughs> I would love to say one thing about editing that I've learned, and I hold it dear to my heart, that I was conceptualized in tape, but it's still transferred to digital, is the breaths and right. space. Yes. Breaths and space is it. Those are the fundamentals. Of course, we hear things all the time that doesn't acknowledge those nuances. But if you really want to keep a conversation natural and non-distracting, you have to adjust for the breaths and the spaces. Let's dive into that a little bit because I talked to an engineer with audiobooks. Mm -hmm. The last book I did, they wanted the breaths removed. And talked to an engineer. He's like, well, you know, that makes people nervous when you remove all the breaths. At the same time, you don't want to sound like you've got emphysema. Right. 
Do you have like a middle ground that you've got? Where are they with somebody like fresh air? Because sometimes the breaths and the space, that's really what accentuates the word. It's pacing. Um, well, usually you want to keep what happened naturally in the moment. But if somebody does have a cold or if the breath sounds like they're like, <gasps> right, you just replace it. You find something else that's easier on the ear. Right. You just swap it out. I remember I um, edited a novelist, which I will not say the name of. I had to replace all of the breaths in the entire interview because the person had a real bad cold. And you're doing this with the X-Acto knife or the blade? With a razor blade, yeah. So this isn't like you're running it through RX like all these youngins do today. Yeah. No, 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 no. That was like, oh, because she had, it was like, it was a total, like, horrible, you could smell, you could smell, you could, yeah, you could smell and hear all the phlegm coming in her nose. And yeah, uh, every, this was work. Back then, we couldn't do any transfers or anything. We always had to bring in transfers to the studio. So I didn't even... I want you to define that because people don't understand transfers. Okay, so transferring something, say you have a clip. Say you're interviewing uh, Joni Mitchell and you want to play Big Yellow Taxi. Way back when, the recording would have been on a CD. You bring that into the studio, and if you're cutting on tape, you have a couple tape machines. The engineer has blank tape and one deck, then um, the CD player hit, and then you have the interview. And the engineer makes it come together, as we would call it mixing. Um, right. but now you just put it, you pop it all together, but back Drag then it drop, was, yeah. it was a whole process and you had a, you know, book studio time and all these crazy things. The person who you were talking to, who likes to take out the breaths, what kind of business was that? What kind of, um, forum was that? Well, it was audible. Audible wants that stuff removed to put something to audible specs. And the engineer that I was actually working with to make sure that we had the specs, he was warning me about that. He goes, you know, yeah. It's going to make people a little bit nervous because it doesn't sound natural. We, I think when we're having a conversation, we're listening for breaths without even knowing it, or we expect them mm -hmm. to be there. It's a cadence. Yeah. 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 It helps that pacing with a conversation. He was mentioning that, but there's just a standard that it's almost like my, my wife is a photographer and they do Photoshop on already beautiful people to make them <clears throat> more beautiful, mm. but it doesn't look natural. Right. It's the look and the same thing when we have compressed voices. And oh, it's too polished. Audio. Right. Yeah. Well, curious too about, because I believe me, I hear it everywhere. I like to listen to the news sometimes on TV with my eyes closed. So right. I hear all the commercials that are horribly edited for time. I'm sure for time. Right. Is it edited out the breath, but keep the space or just yeah. it bumps up to, or does the one word bump up to each other? Uh, you're not going to bump it up next to each other. Yeah. You'll keep the pause, but sometimes they're going to even look for the pause because yeah. that's just probably a, an engineer's, uh, you know, whatever they think. Like I'm sure with, with the pacing that you guys have on an NPR show, mm -hmm. it's going to be different than maybe a pacing of a business show. But it's funny you mentioned actually watching the news. I actually had to have a dialogue editor from Fox and CNN specialized only in dialogue to actually fix my dialogue for me to those standards. Really? No breaths. Huh. And it's not my preference. I listened to it. I was like, what the? <laughs> yeah. Does it, that doesn't sound like me, but it sounds better in a car and it's more accessible. So it's not necessarily uh, good audio, but it's correct audio. Yeah, I get it. And also, I mean, I definitely play with breaths. I'll um, lower amplitude. I'll sometimes take them out um, occasionally. Right. If it, right. it just, again, this is the one thing that's really changed is the trust your ears. Yeah. It's spooky because that was the whole entire thing. Like, just trust your ears. Yeah. Well, now it's not like that as much. There's a lot more going into the mix, literally. Well, we can also see the mix now. You think about when your father was recording and you might've had like a VU meter. You had a VU meter, right? <laughs> yeah. That was it. But actually with the magnetic tape, you know, this is fascinating too. They used to record that stuff hot. Yes. Because a couple of days later, whatever, the magnet would release and all this... <laughs> All those particles would make it not so hot within a couple of days. I did not know that. It's fascinating, right? Wait, is that why? Because it's always like, go, go right up to the red, right up to the red. That's yeah. like the rule. Yeah, because they had to get that good signal on there and then just, hey, just give it a couple of days. It's not going to be too hot. I did not I, know that. For, it blew my mind the first time. But those are the things that you learned by listening mm -hmm. with your ear mm -hmm. instead of just watching the meters. Yep. And now with editing... We can get so specific and with things like RX, I know guys that run these things, these things being interviews or whatever through these programs and never listen. I think we've lost that year. Yeah. And it's, I can't 
cry my heart out about it. We have to adapt, right? Adapt or die. Yeah. Anybody who talks about how great analog is has actually never recorded on analog because it is hard work. You can imagine what you're talking about, chopping those breaths out now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of breaths in a 20-minute interview. Oh, yeah. Oh, and one other thing to anyone who's listening, and and I'm such a nitpicky person about this, W breaths are important. People will hear the edit if you butt something else up with a wrong breath. It'll sound like an edit if you have it like a, like if a wind, the wind and the way, the wind and the willows. And um, if you put some breath that was going into a consonant, it'll sound like CRAP. So those are these things that I don't know if people care anymore. <laughs> I've also found with bad breath editings, if you chop them off in the middle, so. <laughs> oh, why would they do that? You don't notice it. And then you hear it. Oh, it's the word. I don't know. The final mix. <laughs> why, would, why would somebody, that's just, just murder. That's yeah. audio murder. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, but it is interesting. I, I do think that what you're talking about, like by having things live even, there's that natural pacing that's done so well. And I think that somebody like Terry Gross goes in thinking about that as far as you mentioning even, she's saying it sounds like you're peeing when you do that. I think we can all hear that in her voice mm-hmm. because we know her voice and we know her cadence. And that's something that comes from probably listening to herself. Is she in there on the edits? Is she listening to herself? no. She does her interview. She does her prep. She's an insanely studious, like she really is deep, deep prep person. And she's doing three of these a day. Well, no, I don't know what she does a day now. It's not as much as before. It was two a day years ago. I I don't know because she has other co-hosts that. But that's a lot of prep. Oh, yeah. Even once or twice a week could be a lot of prep. So talk about what that day looks like for her. Well, she comes in and um, goes, you know, I guess let's see here. She goes to the news, see if there's anything relevant that we have to respond to. And also, you know, you change the show up if new, like, gosh, like I'll say today we are approaching our first um, potential war in our lives. Like, <laughs> so if, if like we would just probably um, bury the tape that we did yesterday with a musician, interview a journalist who's over in um, Kiev and turn that around, that would happen right. today. Right. And then maybe get perspective from another, probably a journalist. That's kind of where we go to an ambassador. So then, yeah, I guess the interviews say there was an interview at 10, um, wrap that up. And then at 11, 1130, go into the studio and prepare the show, the one hour Fresh Air show, which is recording all the ins and outs, wraparounds, intros, outros, all those little things that accompany the actual tape itself. Right. That's usually taped ahead. But Terry is live when the show goes down at noon. So if, if there are any fixes to be done, the producers do it for the next um, rebroadcast. It will never, you know, they put it up into the, the ether and then the, the, the radio stations can um, download the mix, the fix. Yeah, so you're asking if she was in on the edit. No, it was rare that she ever said, keep that in. Basically, she did the prep, she did the interview, and then we editors took it on. When I think back about it, it was a very generous way to go through edits because it was very thoughtful. We would make cases for why we would want to keep something in why we would take it out. And since I worked for Fresh Air, I've worked for other radio shows that had very few people working with me. I didn't have that luxury to go, well, I think I should keep it in because it does this or it adds this context. And I was like, oh no, get it out. Boom, done. There's no thoughtful conversation. (laughs) You know, it seems thoughtful when you hear her talk, even her cadence. And again, she's somebody who's been a professional communicator for 50 something years. Mm -hmm. At this point, and I imagine she's probably editing herself. She does. Oh, yeah. So you have, even before it comes out of her mouth, she's already edited. And I would think that makes your job easier compared to somebody like me who I put my foot in my mouth all the time. She does map out the narrative. She maps out how the interview will go. She knows where it's going to turn. She knows where she wants to end up. Of course, there are things sometimes that a a guest will bring in uh, something into the conversation that she didn't expect. And that will completely change the interview going in a whole direction. And hopefully that made for a really fantastic interview. Let's talk about that though, because she's got to be good on the fly. You've got to have a guest who's going to kind of have that give and take with the host. Mm -hmm. Every time Terry Gross comes up, even when I saw her speak live, she said, everybody asked about the Gene Simmons interview. You were actually there during the Gene Simmons interview. That Mm -hmm. (laughs) infamous, the infamous interview, (laughs) the Gene Simmons interview. Whoa. The infamous Gene Simmons interview. Yeah, we went there. That one was crazy. Patty was there. She's got the behind the scenes of that interview. Saw Terry Gross a few years ago, as I mentioned. 
And that is the one interview that she said people always ask about. So it's cool to hear the story. That is coming up next on part two of my three-parter with veteran radio producer, Patty McMahon. She's also got some great thoughts about how to book guests, how to work with publicists. And related to that Gene Simmons interview, what to do when things go sideways? Because after hundreds and hundreds of interviews, you can imagine things do not always go as planned. We dive into that. That is next, part two of this series. You can get all three parts, bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. That's the way to do it. Three buttons there, one for iPhone, one for Android, one with an RSS feed, bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Go there right now before you forget. Make sure you get part two and part three. It is good as well. And I will see you on the next episode of Build a Big Podcast.